Nevertheless, we are going to start right now. So I hope everybody comes in here. There's a whole series of very interesting lectures or, or talks uh, planned, so please take your seat. And without further ado, we start with uh, Vasiliki Petusi from the University of Crete. And you have already your slide there. Okay, Vasiliki, your, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, hear all these interesting conversations. Uh, what I'm going to present to you is part of a EU project uh, that was funded, ended uh, a couple of months ago. So due to my contractual obligations, I have the template set out. Just a few words on the, just a few words on the project. We, um, the project uh, was aiming to determine the financial and global impact of research misconduct. So the emphasis was research misconduct and research integrity. And that was a call, a uh, reply to a call on estimating the cost of research misconduct and the socioeconomic benefit of research integrity, the, um, the SWAF's uh, calls. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, project, uh, our team um, dealt with the definitional and regulatory framework, quantitative accounts of the extent of the bibliometric uh, appearances of the phenomenon. And then we did a lot of discourse analysis of the contents of scholarly work, interviews, an expert group, a survey, case studies, and then all these were to contribute to the development and visibility and the curse ratio, and at the end, uh, to the estimate of an economic model for the estimate of the cost of research misconduct. Um, today, I'm going to uh, uh, present to you parts of what we did in the experts and stakeholders' understanding of research misconduct and research integrity. In this part, we did the interviews and the focus group, and our main goals were to look for the definitions of research misconduct and research integrity, the extent of the characteristics of the phenomenon, the causes, the impact, the cost, and the harm, and the ways to handle this phenomenon. We had, this were the, these were the main uh, goals. Now, for the focus group that we could be talking about today, uh, this uh, took place in May of 2018 in Heraklion of Crete, lasted approximately two and a half hours, maybe more. I'm um, presenting preliminary findings today, and uh, this, uh, the findings are based on the thematic analysis of transcribed, de-identified discussion in which we had 16 persons, five men, 11 women, with faculty <coughs> positions, PhD candidates. Um, the majority were postdoc researchers on research contracts. Uh, they came from nine countries, and they had expertise in humanities, social sciences, psychology, biotechnology, animal sciences, etc. But the, for the majority, uh, the participants were engaged in multidisciplinary work. Uh, for example, we had one person who was doing uh, um, biomedical research, and had um, they were engaged in a project of biomedical research, and they had a previous degree in history. So. Uh, that was a lot of um, uh, multidisciplinarity. For parts of our analysis, and because I will be referring to this, I'm just uh, presenting to you uh, a scheme that we use to uh, categorize uh, uh, the costs and the causes and all this. Uh, and we, um, we adapted Sovacles and Davis, I misspelled his name, um, suggestions on the narratives about research misconduct. So part, one of the narrative had to do with individual impurity or the one we call the bad apple in research misconduct, then the institutional, the structural failure, and the cultural differences that there are some basic thematic, uh, uh, basic themes that could be used to understand um, the causes of research misconduct. Now for uh, during our focus group, we started uh, discussing the definitional issues. What is research misconduct? What's in research integrity? When it came to research misconduct, uh, our participants, they all mentioned plagiarism, appropriation of work, stealing of data, salami publication. So they had, they, they went ahead and mentioned 
uh, uh, instances of research misconduct, and they provided, for the, uh, the most of them, provided one, at least one personal experience of uh, research misconduct that they were faced with. They also provided experiences of research integrity, and that was very interesting for us. However, in, during the discussion, what became as a surprise and, uh, was that the precarious working conditions and the lack of balance between work and life became, was identified by uh, uh, focus group participants as, as a form of research misconduct. So their, their argument was that we talk about the quality of research, but it's important to think of the researchers as people is about fairness. So they said that um, they saw good working conditions as, uh, as an issue of fairness, not only to research subjects, if we may call research participants, but to researchers as well. Um, furthermore, the quality of life and the working conditions became a horizontal issue at the institutional and the structural failure narrative. So every time they discuss that research misconduct is an indication of institutional or structural failure, they linked it somehow to the life and working conditions of uh, researchers. Now, when it came to discussing extensive characteristics, we all, they, they identified uh, a gift authorship, uh, and they said that this is something really common. Um, by the way, I need to uh, just say here that um, neither our interviewees nor our focus group participants uh, ventured into providing any estimates of the extent. Uh, anytime they uh, referred to extent, they sort of fell into Fanella's uh, uh, one, two percent, that's the, the standard um, measurement. Uh, but they referred to this as of, uh, um, common, not common, and all that. And so gift authorship was one. The impact of senior researchers uh, and the, the, the strength, the power that the researchers have on, uh, on uh, junior researchers, um, they consider to be huge because they say that they define, among other things, the professional career, uh, of the, the future professional career of things. Uh, they also saw the impact of senior researchers as a positive, strong hand, uh, the killer rabbit. Um, one of the uh, participants said that the person was forced to make certain changes. They had stolen his data, this person's data, and the professor discovered it, and then they made uh, changes. They, they demanded and implemented changes. Uh, so in the question, who forced this change, he said, I forced it through my professor. So. But their concern was a hierarchically organized work and the training environment and the impact it has on uh, research misconduct and research in integrity. So it was the way organizations were structured. So they discussed, that they said that it's useless to teach young researchers if then they go to an environment where those words go completely into waste because everyone else above them does not work in an integral way. Uh, just keep in mind that the focus group participants were not uh, native English speakers, and I've maintained the exact wording uh, uh, in, uh, in the quotes. Um, so they go back to a working place to say, and you know the world has not changed after the training of young researchers. They go back to the same place, the, same, the work has not changed. So it's a default culture that remains and they need to be, uh, it needs to be addressed. Now, here is where we started becoming uh, the causes and the impact. This is like a very long and extremely long quote. Um, but I think this summarizes uh, pretty much the spirit of the discussion. It was provided by one of our uh, participants. Um, they talked about, for the most part, the, the focus group researchers uh, participants discussed about the university, the, the shift towards corporate management uh, with the use of terms like executive directors, managing boards and all that, and the economic efficiency, productivity, uh, so the functioning of a university as a commercial enterprise. The argument here was that, okay, I cannot, I cannot um, blame an enterprise for wanting to be productive and, and make money, but this is not how it works for the university and this has spilled over to the way the university is structured. So they say that we work beyond 40 hours, which means work stress, mental health, and no work-life balance. Um, now, why are we working past 40 hours? Because we like it. Uh, or they like it. So that's, uh, that was an, a very interesting, uh, that, that uh, gave um, 
it, it started a very interesting uh, conversation because there was sometimes a discussion whether there's a victim <laughs> in among researchers about the victimized or not and all that. Um, they spoke about they spoke about responsibility. <laughs> And um, they were discussing how uh, the, the importance of performance indicated how funding was distributed, but also how recruitment is uh, taking place about um, relying on objective parameters, bibliometric indicators and things of that sort. And then they discussed about the, the potential and the practice of tweaking everything. They can change everything, change the parameters, and then change uh, who takes part where. The competition, the massification of science in higher education, of research, and this becomes, they say, a perpetual self-feeding self system, um, one that we need to stop and, and, and think about. They linked all this with politics and policies, and here we had two views. One was that, yeah, they make political decisions without the academics, but the second, uh, second participant said, no, that's not the case, because a lot of the people that go into office come out of academia, but then they forget about it. So uh, there is a connection between academia and policy making, um, which, again, has to be uh, attributed to um, uh, academics. Um, and the question, so what can we, be, uh, can we do, what can it be done? Training in research ethics and integrity was one of the suggestions, but the position was very ambivalent. Uh, they're not the, the students who are, the young researchers who are trained, they said they're not really able to bring it to practice because the situation does not allow for that. We have to change the default culture. So there is a default culture there that promotes uh, misconduct and that needs to be changed. Um, but the importance of training is that they become aware that something is going on. So at least with that, you have some kind of check that, oh wait, maybe I should be critical also. So this is uh, an important issue. But the cynical person in our uh, group, they identified themselves as cynical. Uh, they said that integrity will not be the topic that changes this, but the serious, serious problems. The suggestion was to make changes and be the change. Uh, that they have to change the environment and make it an integral working environment, including working uh, hours and, and, uh, and working conditions and things of that sort. And that they, all, they themselves should be the change. They should be the ambassadors. What is it? Here's my ambassadors. They should be the ambassadors that can spread the word and explain what is right and what is not. <coughs> and here comes excellence. It was a theme that was not anticipated, but while we were discussing um, causes, effects, and impact, um, we had a conscious si shift to use the word excellence. Somebody suggested that we discuss excellence. And then um, excellence for, the, uh, for some of the researchers was one of them that says that excellence is what makes you feel complete as a researcher, as a, as a person. And excellence is about the skills you develop, how you adapt yourself, how you be corrective and how you have critical thinking. And you have to be a person who creates position places for people to come into science. So nurturing and, and mentorship and all this. Excellence is something that expresses itself on the long run and we need to give people time to mature as researchers so they can be excellent. The bottom, Line's suggestion was that we need to slow down science. They actually said that. We have to slow down science. Then integrity is not an issue because you have lots of time to work on this article and do it right. And then the impact you would be there because you have done a good article rather than just rush it, rush it out and then have to figure out what to do. So I think this is a very good summary of the suggestions of the people. Our uh, young, early career researchers, scientists in our focus group are concerned about the way the scientific enterprise is changing organized structure, how it is created, the lack of balance between personal and professional life, the argue for transparency and involvement of the general public, training in ethics and integrity, but overall they see that they are virtuous in the scientific thinking and method and these are well worth defending. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Vasiliki, and particularly for staying within your time limit. Actually, you we, we had one more minute left, but we will take that in discussion. So we will do the same format as earlier. We have all the speakers first, and please collect your questions and comments to later. So would I, I would now like to invite Mats uh, to the table. Mats Dahl is going to talk about intellectual property management and the value landscapes of publicly funded research. Okay. Mats, you have 15 minutes. All right. So um, I am a uh, newcomer here in the PNS world, but I come from a STS background and I'm currently an RRI researcher at OsloMet. And I'm going to be talking about a uh, research topic that I've been playing around with, but kind of struggling to figure out exactly how to uh, sharpen it and, and, uh, and uh, translate it into something doable. But it's kind of a product of these different motivations uh, of mine, uh, one of which is the sort of distinctiveness of universities as a social institution, and an interest in um, various forms of interconnectedness, awareness, uptake and receptiveness uh, in various governance and policy uh, settings, as well as in universities for that matter, uh, that happens without explicitly addressing the banners of uh, RRI or PNS or what have you. Um, and then I'm also generally interested in the sort of interpretive uh, affordances of technological promises and promise making, uh, as well as uh, metrics of uh, success or impact and, and the ways that these types of anchors are uh, used um, to uh, inform uh, legitimate legitimacy debates around various institutions. And then I also have uh, been outside of research on the dark side, so to speak, uh, working in university technology transfer uh, um, at a university technology transfer setting in the US for, for a while. And I'd like to sort of take the experiences from that um, and bring it into a researchable topic. So now, for those of you who aren't aware, um, technology transfer offices are sort of a staple institution within uh, many public universities. They are the office that uh, are responsible for protecting and commercializing intellectual property. Um, there is a lot of discussion in the scientific literature already about the ways that uh, TTOs manage uh, different expectations for value creation and legitimacy. So uh, I'll be referencing two ongoing discussions in the research policy journal here. Uh, one uh, article by O'Kane et al. talks about the need to balance um, different systems for, for valuing the TTO office within university settings where they sort of contrast the expectations uh, and norms of academics against the expectations of university management for the kinds of contributions that TTOs make to the institution. So they talk about the uh, complicated and overlapping and at times conflicting logics of commercialization and academic norms. Another example of the ongoing research policy discussion around TTOs is the various ways that effectiveness is, is uh, measured and talked about in relation to TTOs. So you have a lot of traditional indicators and metrics around what TTOs contribute, uh, some of which are captured as market impact uh, and economic development. So patents, licensing agreements, spin-off companies, revenue generated for inventors, universities, and so on. But you also have, um, in, the, in the bottom line here, public value as this emerging category of indicators, which, as you can see in the bottom uh, right, um, escapes quantification um, uh, and, and is difficult to measure systematically in the terms that uh, research policy would like it to be. So in trying to focus in, in on these debates um, towards a researchable topic that has to do with values, um, I'm, I'm generally interested in this misalignment between conventional TTO indicators, invention disclosures where faculty members bring ideas for evaluation for commercial potential to TTOs, 
uh, actual patents, licensing, revenue of intellectual property, spin-outs, and so on. Um, and the sort of changing expectations for value creation from publicly funded research and innovation. So my idea that I'd like to develop further is to use TTO's own storytelling to uh, try and interpret how they position themselves vis-a-vis um, -vis these newer expectations that are hard to quantify regarding public value creation. So what I'm presenting here is a very tentative uh, desktop survey um, of uh, how TTOs tell qualitative stories about their impacts and effectiveness. So I did this simply by going to the uh, Reuters Top 100 uh, Innovative Uni European in Universities ranking, uh, whose selection criteria is heavily skewed towards various um, patent numbers, really, numbers of patents, their commercial success, and so on. And then uh, going by the languages I speak, I picked the three uh, English-speaking universities and, and went over their TTO websites to compare their actual quantitative uh, metrics that they use to promote themselves with various types of press releases, um, storytelling, showcase articles that they've developed to look for how TTOs present themselves in those stories, but also what the stories seem to imply uh, around the impacts and benefits of the transferred innovations. So example one here, Imperial College London, whose uh, TTO is called Imperial Innovations. You'll see that the qualitative, uh, quantitative uh, indicators here are uh, around jobs created, uh, numbers of in invention disclosures, companies founded by faculty members uh, or students, and license agreements executed. But if you look at the sort of top or three newest uh, case studies that they've had uh, someone write up uh, narratives about. You'll see uh, first a um, story around a promising uh, vision loss gene therapy that was developed in a collaboration between Oxford and ICL researchers, resulting in a spin-out company uh, and an initial public offering raising $77 million. So the emphasis, emphasis here, um, as far as impact goes, is really about the, the revenue that is being generated um, and the TTO's role in that, um, bringing revenue back to the university and the inventor. But there's also something here about the uh, qualities of the technology itself that is being transferred. Stars in their eyes refers to a quote by uh, a patient uh, that is being interviewed about um, being able to have night vision again uh, as a result in, of this technology. Secondly, uh, a pipe monitoring technology um, developed in collaboration with BP, culminating, like the first example, in a startup company and then eventually acquisition as well. Here the TTO presents itself as a planner of a commercialization process as well as an investor in that process. And again, the emphasis is on revenue generation for the university. In the third example, you have a story of uh, a visual search system coming out of a computer science department uh, where um, Imperial Innovations supported intellectual property protection and then went through several processes to validate different market applications for that technology. Uh, it was a novel technology, but with um, possibilities for all sorts of different uses. So the story talks about uh, trials and errors, essentially, at making is, this into a commercial product. So one feature about the TTO that I think is interesting here is that it's presenting itself as being adaptive to a sort of non-linear uh, innovation process. Second example, University of Cambridge, you'll see the uh, performance indicators are somewhat similar. Um, quantified income, revenue distribution, costs, uh, investments, consultations with inventors, licenses executed, uh, funding and investments secured. But if you look at the case studies from Cambridge, uh, you'll again see some other features come out. So the first story here was about um, software licensing models 
uh, as a concept. Now, software licensing, intellectual property protection around software is kind of a sticky area for technology transfer offices. It doesn't really fit um, a lot of the logics around patentability and commercializing patents. So it was, in fact, a story about uh, Cambridge Enterprise's different uh, approaches and expertise in uh, coming up with feasible business models for um, the um, software area. Uh, one feature that was emphasized in this article that I found particularly interesting was uh, a, a really strong emphasis speaking to researchers at Cambridge on this idea that um, even though you commercialize pieces of software, um, there are ways to build business models in such ways that you'll also be free to share these software tools that you develop as part of your research within the academic community. So in terms of self-presentation, I think the TTO here is really emphasizing its supportiveness of academic norms, academic freedom and collaboration um, without profit as the main uh, motivation. I'll skip past the second one here and go to the third one where Cambridge Enterprise uh, talks about it being approached by a new university that is funded in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe uh, and asked to consult on the concept and development strategy for an intellectual and innovative cluster around a new uh, university. So here, I think, again, similar to the first example, what is emphasized is not really the um, features of any one technology, but the expertise of the organization itself. And it's, in this case, orientation towards innovation systems uh, rather than the um, licensing process itself. University of Manchester is the third example here. Again, you see these um, pretty conventional figures um, that are uh, um, widely used metrics in the TTO world. And as far as case studies, uh, they were structured a little differently for uh, University of Manchester IP. Uh, they were structured around spin-out companies, social enterprises, and licensing. So I picked one from each. On the so social enterprise uh, case study, they presented a story of um, sort of a training module uh, around self-harm mitigation and postvention. Um, which was copyrighted and um, developed into a social enterprise with input from um, licensing experts at Cambridge Enterprise. One quote that stood out here was uh, the inventor actually speaking to this idea that through working with the technology transfer office, they determined that uh, a company vehicle was really the best pathway to have a social impact in the topic area that they had their expertise in. And then there are some other examples here from these articles where TTO sort of signal various values. So Ross ran back to his office to file a patent. Uh, license thing through Cambridge Enterprise does not limit academic freedom. Uh, don't think that moving to the commercialization landscape will detract from your core research if it's structured in the right way. It can complement and indeed add to it. So there are lots of ways here where you kind of sense that TTOs are justifying themselves uh, towards faculty members in anticipation of some sort of um, suspicion or resistance to TTOs and how they might conflict with academic norms. So some first impressions then, uh, through storytelling, TTOs definitely seek this intra-institutional legitimacy that the research policy discussions were talking about. There's a balancing act uh, going on here, navigating the academic norms and commercialization logics. But there's also this feature of TTOs appearing to confront sources of potential faculty skepticism and resistance to TTOs. So TTOs really emphasize their, uh, uh, that they will not really intrude on faculty's time, research autonomy, freedom to share inventions, etc. TTOs describe the tools and normative implications of technology transfer pathway options. Um, you could take this to indicate that public value um, is present as a real legitimate emphasis in how TTOs operate. But if you look at the um, 
benefits of the transfer technologies that is being presented is really sort of a priori technology use benefits, narrow, general, non-systemic, sort of a feature of the uh, technology simply going into the society or into the market and being used as designed. There's no uh, analysis exactly of, uh, or questioning of, of the sort of more systemic surprising effects of technology transfer processes. Now that's not really surprising, but to my last point here, it does suggest that public values may not be such a novel or genuinely world-changing feature of how T2Os uh, manage um, to monitor their own performance. It may in fact just be uh, a set of stories that very neatly translate into, back into these conventional metrics that deal with successfully transferred uh, technologies from universities to the marketplace. So I'm a little skeptical of how far this public values categories uh, goes as, as a, a sort of turn in, in more societally responsive technology transfer operations. So here are some options for studying this further. Um, I'd like to pursue research questions around how TTOs interact with other university services and programs, or how universities um, uh, respond to university systems in times of crisis, so public funding cuts and so on. Methodologically, you can narrow this down around tiers of universities or comparative dimensions across countries or fields. And the analytical expansions that we're in this to get to, I think, are back towards the bigger questions around academia's legitimacy claims, researchers' motivations, career paths, and um, thoughts about societal impact, and then meanings and affordances of the innovation concept itself. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mats, also for again sticking to the time. I will now call the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Matko, who yes. guest, to talk about exploring scientists' values through their perspectives on nature in scientific publications. Matko, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Marco Vasquez. I'm a master's student at, in the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. And today I'm going to present you some of the results of my thesis project, which explores values in science in an evidence-based policy controversy. First, our values impact almost everything we do, and science is no exception. A well-known example for this was given by the philosopher Helen Longino when she defined three decision points where values could influence science. The first is the problems that the scientists choose to investigate. Second, the limitations that they choose to put on their methodological choices. And finally, how do the scientists think the results should be interpreted and applied. But there's also the opposite view, which is the value-free ideal, and it states that science is completely objective and that values have no role in it. But several scholars in the last decade or so have argued that this view is deeply problematic, mainly when talking about science for policy. For example, values can influence how a problem is framed. And this can affect different decisions, like uh, which evidence is considered more important, or which type of error and its social consequences are more concerning. And in this case, we can talk about the chemical substances, and how type one, or type one errors or false positives involve saying that a substance is harmful when it is not, and this can lead to high costs for industries and societies. On the other hand, a type two error or false negative involves saying that the substance is not harmful when in fact it is, and this can carry risks for human health and also environment. So this illustrates how even decisions about just statistical limits on the type of errors are imbued by values. And this is a reason why it is crucial to find ways to shed, lights, to shed light on the different values that are influencing the scientific research. And so far, um, a lot of studies in the science and technology are studies area uh, focus on values in science, but 
you know, from a more theoretical perspective and in large and contentious debates, like for example, climate change, as we heard earlier, and also GMOs. But there's a lack of more empirical studies on a more local scale. This is why my research focuses on sewage, because it is a really interesting topic to study values in science, because it is usually framed as a purely technical issue, and that we just need to do more research in order to get the answers. But this way of viewing that these kind of topics usually obscure all the value judgments made in the scientific research behind it. And my case is the over 50 year long wastewater controversy in the Capital Regional District, whose headquarters are in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. There, the debate is whether or not it makes sense from a sustainability point of view to treat the sewage or to discharge it untreated into the ocean. Because since the early 19th century, the region has discharged its sewage into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is right there in the Pacific Ocean. And well, uh, in 2006, the Provincial Minister of Environment sent the CRD a letter requiring a scale for wastewater treatment. And 10 years later, in 2016, the region decided to build a centralized plant that should be finished by 2020. And ever since the 60s, the scientists have been part of this controversy. And well, the debate that they have been having has been quite loud. Those that are supporting the wastewater treatment say that they are worried about the presence of persistent organic pollutants, pharmaceuticals, microplastics, and endocrine disruptors, because they see this as a reason to treat the sewage and to protect the environment. But those that are against the treatment say that these so-called pollutants are mostly organic matter and nature can deal with that. So therefore, they do not represent an environmental concern. They even say that there is evidence of lack of harm. But the pro-treatment scientists also mentioned that the moral responsibility that people have of not polluting the ocean. But the anti-treatment scientists also say that, well, a treatment plant would not work, is energy inefficient, and also have different harmful environmental consequences. So um, these public statements have led us to hypothesize that the scientists' positions are tied to their perception of nature and human impact, and also that we can find those perceptions in their scientific publications, because the, these perceptions are impacting their research. Therefore, I set out to perform a qualitative content analysis of the abstract and the introduction of scientific peer review publications from scientists who have a public position in the debate, who have minimum of 10 publications in scientific peer review journals where they are the first or the last author, and finally, whose research is tied somehow to the wastewater management field. This link between the research and field was guided by this matrix. In the first row, you can see the environmental targets that the wastewater management strategies are trying to protect. And these represent nature in my analysis. Also, the polluting factors whose concentration all the wastewater management strategies are trying to minimize or control. Here it's important to note that organic matter, nitrogen, and phosphorus are also seen as valuable resources that we should recover from wastewater but it is recognized that all of them, when they are in excess in the environment, can have harmful environmental consequences. So far, I have analyzed 10 publications from four different scientists, two on each side. My two, well, the two anti-treatment scientists, they are conducting research that is looking at heavy metals or trace elements in the oceans, while the one of the pro-treatment scientists is looking also at heavy metals, but he is also looking at persistent organic pollutants and other emerging contaminants again in the ocean. While my, the other pro-treatment scientist is looking at water bodies and also nutrient in these water bodies. So this is my coding frame. I will present it for sake of clarity as a flowchart. First, I focus on targets. Uh, if there, is, there are one or more targets mentioned in the paper, and then co I code if there is any mention or discussion about a negative human impact on these targets. If there is not, then I code how these targets are framed. Then I focus on the factors. And if there are one or more mentioned, of course, 
then I, I code if they're framed similarly to the wastewater field, management field, as I mentioned earlier, the factors in mainly, and then if they're focusing on the negative environmental consequences, I code if they're framed as human cost. If the answer of those last two questions is no, then I focus on how are the factors framed. If none of this is part of the paper, I know that, but it's not part of my analysis. So my results so far show that the pro-treatment scientists uh, usually emphasize the negative human impacts from, uh, on the targets. For example, they say one of them says that dam construction, wetland drainage, overfishing, habitat loss, and climate change are different human activities that are negatively influencing lakes, rivers, and streams because they are removing nutrients from them. So therefore, they are emphasizing how human activities are affecting negatively this. Another example is mercury. Here it is said that it is a toxic element that is coming from human activities, and then again, is representing a health concern for marine wildlife. When they talk about the factors, the pro-treatment scientists usually frame them similarly to the wastewater management field. For example, again, mercury, this, uh, the scientist that is looking at it says that it has the ability to induce different toxic responses in marine top predators. So it's, ha it's talking about the negative consequences of mercury and also Again, he emphasizes that it's coming from human activities. And in the, this is another example, phosphorus, again, as I mentioned, he says that it's essential to our life, it's a valuable resource because we use it in food production, but it is recognized as a, uh, that if it is in excess in the environment, it can cause eutrophication, which is a problem. On the other hand, the anti-treatment scientists they usually frame the targets as relevant for processes or nature, in this case climate change, and there's no mention of human impact. For example, when they talk about marine primary production, they say that it's important to forecast how the systems will res ecosystems will respond to climate change because here the marine primary production is tied to the capacity or the ability of the ocean to absorb CO2 from the environment. And the other example is Water stratification in the Nordic Seas, when then again it's useful for um, to forecast the impact of greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. Some of those emissions probably are coming from human activities, but there is no mention of human impact. There is no negative frame here; just they are mentioning the greenhouse gases. And when they talk about the factors, usually they say that they're useful for natural processes and for scientific understanding. In the case of cadmium, they say that it's a micronutrient, which is good for different organisms, and it's also useful for us as a tracer to know, to study biological productivity and circulation in the ocean. The other example is talking about trace metals in general. They, one of the scientists say that it, they are useful, again, as micronutrients, so they are good. They are useful as paleoproxies. So this means that we can use them to study previous geological ages, well, the climate conditions and the ocean conditions in previous ge geological ages. And they also mentioned that they are toxins and that they could be tracers of anthropogenic input. This means that we can use them to study how humans and na are interacting with nature. But again, there is no negative frame when they talk about that. So some of the conclusions that they are looking at similar things in different ways. For example, when they talk about the targets, the pro-treatment scientists, they usually focus on the negative human impact on them. While the anti-treatment scientists, they just say that they are useful for different processes. And the factors are framed similar to the wastewater management field from the pro-treatment scientists. They are caring more about in the research, they are caring more about the uh, toxic effects from heavy metals. In, they are caring about how we can use, sustainably use phosphorus, while the anti-treatment scientists, they say that these factors, they are useful for different natural processes. They are useful for us to study those processes, so they do not represent an environmental concern. Nature is using them. So this is uh, what I have been doing. and. The further steps is to apply my coding frame to other papers 
so this will help me with the validity of my code, my method that I'm doing right now. Well, not right now, but uh, cross coding to improve reliability of again the method, and finally a second stage of my project will involve interviews with different scientists to support the findings and compare how they are they are looking at the same things in the research and in their comparing that to how do they think about them when they are not doing the research. Yep, perfect, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. This is a perfect panel. Everybody stays good within the, uh, the time limit. So I now invite the next speaker to the panel and that is Mimi Lam. Um, you also have 15 minutes to talk about seafood ethics Mapping value landscapes in resource management. Okay, first question. Hi, I'm. Should we just go over? Uh, my question is to you, Irina. Um, and uh, I wanted to know if you have any ideas of how to slow down science. If this is an ideal, but how is it actually going to Satanizamos. No tiene la misma calidad. What is this now? <laughs> and, and I also had a question for you, so maybe we uh, do you, So the first question was about how to slow down science. Yeah. Was that your question? Okay. And, and it's actually to the same speaker, first speaker. If, if it's u useful to distinguish between different kinds of... Uh, yeah, yeah, but wait yeah. a second. Yeah, yeah, please. Just different, continue with your question. It's not fixed anyway, but uh, anyway, uh, different kinds of e ethical issues. For example, you had the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the culture and the power structure, but actually some of the, some of the other topics could arguably be, be in there as well, for example, mentoring. So it seems to me that there's a aspects of um, you know, the qual uh, the, the Es importante porque valida justo que los programas que se imparten en línea en este país <laughs> tienen características similares a los programas que se imparten en la misma modalidad en el nuestro. Entonces, conocer lo que hacen otras instituciones sorry, de, un, de un modo u otro validan o nos permiten conocer lo que ocurre en, en España here. específicamente y verificar que no está tan distante de lo que ocurre en México. Okay, okay so, go ahead. so it seems to me that there might be, say, three, three different categories that, 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 that I can see. There's, there's the, um, whether the... Puede ayudar de muchas maneras, puesto que ustedes son expertos en educación a distancia, que es el tipo de formación que a veces es la más accesible para los colaboradores de la agencia, y además tienen un máster específico en calidad de la educación superior que embona muy bien con el perfil que tenemos como agencia de evaluación externa. Finished? It's a speakers, yeah. Okay, so there's things like like faking <laughs> data, which means that the data is not not even reliable. Then there's things that could be affecting the quality of the science. For example, the the the, the senior the honorary authorship or or the um, salami publishing. Um, and then there's the there's the cultural things themselves uh, in terms of how mentoring takes place and so on. Aren't those sort of different? Wouldn't it be useful to maybe not put all those in in the same pot? I'm asking. Okay. Well, thank you for both questions. Um, uh, for the slowing down. In this case, they can be citizens of the world. In this sense, to know what happens with other agencies. Okay. Vasiliki, come here and talk to this microphone. Try to be very, very brief. Um, there were suggestions for slowing down science. Uh, there, was, there was a discussion about people not answering their email, uh, putting strict hours, uh, specific working hours. Um,
The problem was with the people who were on contractual, on contracts, on research contracts, and these people had no working hours. Uh, it was a very, it was a messy situation. So, but they were actually trying to be as clear as possible with their uh, supervisors about what they have to do and all that. Um, they had major problems. The ones who were on, contract on contracts, they had major problems slowing down science because they had to make a living. Um, and, but the people who had more permanent positions, so that might be an answer to this, like permanent positions, they could manage their time differently. Plus, some of the people in the, uh, the focus group, they did say that in their universities, nobody responded email during the weekend. I mean, it was, it was established as a culture, let's say, at the university. Mind you that the more southern the country, the more complicated the work uh, schedule. Um, now, as for the different ethics, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be <laughs> really uh, fast with this. As for the rest of ethics, yes, indeed, and this is like, it's a whole part of the project that we have different, eth different misconduct cases or different integrity cases, uh, instances, and yes, this, it's not the same um, uh, treatment. Uh, we've dealt with it in different aspects. I could not go through all of it, but we did go uh, through different aspects. Like, for example, with the interviews and our uh, survey that we did, we can see that people react differently to different uh, ethical issues. But, and that would be my last comment, I'm kind of uh, <laughs> here. here. Um, one of the things that I think is very important in this research is that there's less concern about the standard misconduct cases, ethics violations, such as the, the FFP, I mean, the things that we know, and there's less concern about this. Uh, then they, the, for the most part, people say that in my, biomedicine, yes, it does have a lot of issues, so it's like a discipline that we should be aware of, but their suggestion is that we should be keeping an eye out for the questionable research practices, practices we have not identified as ethically uh, problematic yet, and this would emerge and are emerging in uh, disciplines such as sociology, social science, political psychology was uh, ranked top, and data management, personal data management uh, like cases. Okay, wait a second here. Now, uh, uh, now, what is happening? I have the feeling everybody has thrown in the towel and nothing much is happening either with the screen or what? And What? Yeah, let's leave it like that. I mean, we did the other presentations like that. Why don't you do it with, like that? Yeah, let's do it. Like okay, then come up, please, and start your presentation. Otherwise, we don't get a time for that. No, well, I believe it was the last question. I think you addressed it all. Thank you very much, Vasiliki. And now, finally, um, it's 40. Uh, Mimi, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you all for your patience through that. Um, you've all been admiring my logo for my project, um, ECs, Enhancing Seafood Ethics and Sustainability. Um, it's a Marie Curie project, and I'm just going to focus today on uh, the aspect that looks at mapping value landscapes in resource management. So to begin, and I think this is maybe not as necessary in this panel, but when we talk about marine science and policy, what I often like to raise is the fact that there are implicit values in those um, in the science and policy discussions that typically aren't raised. And I just wanted to show this other elephant in the room in addition to Dorothy's, um, is, is the values uh, elephant. And for those of you Spanish speakers, I happen to have this translated in Spanish. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so in resource management, Typically, there's a lot of discussion about the triple bottom line of sustainability, looking at the ecological, economic, and social pillars. What I am doing is uh, looking at the implicit values embedded within those discussions and relating those um, to ethics and trying to develop robust ethical decision support tools uh, to help with management of marine resources in particular. And so as I mentioned, this is part of a Marie Curie uh, project. Um, where I'm trying to develop a new interdisciplinary uh, field called seafood ethics. And so I begin with presenting our uh, working definition of seafood ethics, which is that it's a descriptive and normative study of, eth of values, value-based trade-offs, and ethical dilemmas of stakeholders and citizens along diverse seafood value chains. 
And so for this talk, I'm just gonna focus on the relationship between values and choices. And what is that relationship if there is one? And what I'm gonna do to investigate that question is to present to you some results from research that I conducted with colleagues in Canada, developing a value and ecosystem-based management approach to marine resource management. And what we did there was um, did participatory value mapping and scenario preference exercises among stakeholders and community members around the management of Pacific herring. I'm gonna focus on that, but just to tell you, in this work, we, tried, we connected the results of that value-based approach to ecological modeling of those same scenarios in order to provide policy recommendations that are based on both the stakeholder preferences and the ecological impacts of those scenarios. So in terms of the value-based uh, aspect of that research, we used a practical ethics approach and developed a set of um, 12 value cards on, uh, that are depicted here. And what you see is the name of the value and an image that we used to associate with the value. And on the back of the cards was a brief definition. And then we asked our interviewees to uh, prioritize those values. Um, and the result is what we call um, value landscapes. And so for the Haida Gwaii community members, which are composed of indigenous Haida and non-Haida members, um, their uh, value rankings are um, shown here, the median ranks. Um, and you see that respect and responsibility came up on top and authority and sanctity were the lowest. For the members of the herring industry that we also interviewed, we see that their value rankings are very similar. And this was a somewhat surprising result because we, we conducted this research in the midst of a conflict around the management of the Pacific herring fishery. Um, but we decided to um, do an intervention in a sense to try to um, investigate people's values and relate those to their preferences for management. So keeping in mind that in terms of the management, these two communities are, are quite polarized. Um, when we then asked them about their preferences around different scenarios, and the scenarios that we asked them about were designed so that they focused on particular values of the herring. Um, and so the first one is where there was no commercial fishery, and that focuses on the ecological value of herring. The second is where there's only a commercial spawn on kelp fishery, and that spawn on kelp fishery is a non-capture fishery where you, um, what's collected are the eggs of the herring um, on organic substrates, and in this case on kelp. That is a traditional food of the indigenous communities on the coast in British Columbia, and so that focuses on the cultural value of herring. The third um, is the current management scenario, um, which we um, argue would focus on the economic value of the herring. And then the fourth is more of an imaginary in a sense that we're looking at these two different herring fisheries, um, the roe herring and the spawn on kelp fisheries and proposing that they be managed separately. And so that would focus on the different values and uh, impacts of herring. So when we asked our interviewees about their preferences around those scenarios, what we found was um, the preferences of the Haida Gwaii community members, uh, none of them preferred the current management, which we called heart of herring, um, whereas many of them preferred the whale of a time scenario, which, where there was no commercial fishery at all. And this is in stark contrast to the preferences of the herring industry, where the majority preferred the current management scenario, um, and some still did prefer um, having the, no commercial fishery at all. But what's interesting here is that um, despite their similar value prioritizations, they had very different scenario preferences. So then you might argue that, well, probably their, their values didn't influence their scenario preferences. So we investigated that. And so what we did was we asked people with those value cards to place them on the um, images of the scenarios that they thought reflected those values. And so since those values had been previously prioritized, we can sum up the scores of each of those values that are placed on a scenario and come up with a, a value-based preference for those scenarios. And so what we found in comparing the value-based scenario preferences with the stated scenario preferences is that they were actually quite similar. Um, and that's reflected by the strong diagonal elements in this matrix comparing those two approaches. So it still doesn't resolve this question of why there's a difference between the um, value prioritizations and the scenario preferences, but it does suggest that the values do inform people's preferences on how they think the fishery should be managed. And perhaps it's because the different individuals interpreted the values differently and that there's some 
hence uh, ambiguity in terms of the values, that there is obviously no singular definition of what the value means to different people. And that's something that we're investigating further in our qualitative aspect of our research, looking more closely at the transcripts when we asked individuals, why did you uh, rank the values as you did and what did they mean to you? So another thing that we investigated then, so far I've shown you the communal value rankings through their median ranks. So that was the valued landscape of the community in Haida Gwaii and of the herring industry members. So the next thing we did was looked instead at what about if we're losing information through that aggregation. And so we instead looked at um, on the individual level, the prioritizations of the individuals in the Haida Gwaii community and with their, within the herring industry and to see if there's any clustering that we observe based on those individual rankings of values to their scenario preferences. And what you see in this rather busy slide is there is no clustering. So again, it's, it's more of a negative result that I'm presenting to you is that the values do not, on an individual or community level, predict scenario preferences in our case. So this comes up, presents us with a conundrum, um, is that what we conclude from it is that values are contextual and ambiguous and that there are no, as Thomas Pott has says, deontic operators for values, or in more lame person's language, that values do not determine choices. So what do we do next? It's an open question that I presented earlier, is the, what is the relationship between values and choices? And so what we can see is that it's very complex, and it's not, there's no easy, simple, linear connection between values and choices. So obviously our values are influenced by our beliefs and our identities, our attitudes, norms, and principles, um, which are then connected to our choices. And so what we're doing in the next aspect of the research, and I'm doing with, and particularly in my Marie Curie project, is looking at the importance of principles and norms as externalized uh, values from the individual that might be better determinants of choices. And so as I mentioned, instead to focus on principles, we see that um, principles are our normative statements or values or normative statements that guide action without prescribing specific actions. And so um, what we want to do is recognizing that values are contextually embedded and interpreted, that we want to explore further uh, principles in marine resource management. So you may be concluding now that what I'm suggesting is that there's no point to look really at values if we're interested in resource management. But Oh, sorry, I forgot there's another. This is just to illustrate um, some different principles then that we are investigating that may be important in marine resource management. And this is just to illustrate the differences between equality, equity, and justice as possible. Principles that may influence people's choices and preferences. But what I was about to say is that with respect to our values research, that we don't want I don't want to suggest that we should throw out the values baby with the bathwater. And in this case, I refer to it as a values baby because the research in values is quite, despite there's a long-standing tradition of investigating values, there's no coherent theory of values. And so what we want to do is to do more robust scientific research about values that's interdisciplinary, that will probe further what are these um, relationships from a more fundamental perspective. And so I present to you back some of the um, work we have in progress of those community value landscapes for the Haida Gwaii community and for the herring industry. But what we've done, and these are results uh, of research we conducted in Canada. And so we've taken those same sets of value cards and asked people in different parts of the world what they thought. And so these are results from a group of herring um, researchers and civil society representatives. This was also conducted in Canada, but it was a, uh, a group of international uh, people that were part of this. And then we, we did this also in Chile, um, in India, um, at the Eurosafe meeting um, in Vienna earlier this year, and then in Barcelona's Numbers for Policy course in August. And what I just wanted to say is what we're doing here is recognizing that there are some similarities and also differences in terms of the rankings and the variance across those different values. And so we're looking at that a bit further. And what we're doing is uh, multidimensional scaling and discriminant analyses to see if um, we can come up with some relationships between those value rankings. And what you see here is just that what's the most striking of the overall results is that the, there is actually s similar value rankings across all those different groups within North America, South America, Asia, and Europe that we've conducted so far. So just to conclude, what I want to say is this, 
the purpose of the talk was not to give you any definitive conclusion other than to open up the box and say that we need more nuanced, contextualized scientific research on values if we want to try to understand better how to manage resources in a more sustainable fashion, particularly when there's conflicts and policy trade-offs as there increasingly are today. Thank you. Thank you.